Welcome back. If you look at China's record of economic growth, you will find its GDP climbs up at almost the same rate as its coal consumption. Can the country's economy grow without burning more fossil fuels? Well, joining me now to discuss that and China's energy policy and growth strategy in Beijing is Wang Tao. He is a resident scholar at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy in Beijing. Joining us from Paris is Barbara Finnemal. She is a senior attorney and the Asia director at the U.S. Natural Resources Defense Council. And joining us in the studio is Zhang Tao. He is the founder and CEO of Dao Ventures, an investment group in green energy projects in China. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Let's start in Paris with Barbara. Barbara, as we know, of course, China is among the lead negotiators at the Paris uh, climate change talks. Do you expect there will be some meaningful agreement that will come out of these talks, uh, let's say, by the end of the weekend? Uh, yes, I do think there will be a meaningful agreement reached perhaps as early as tomorrow. Uh, over 180 countries have already pledged strong commitments to reduce their CO2 emissions, and that will happen no matter what form the final agreement may take. And China is leading uh, the way as the world's leading greenhouse gas emitter in pledging to cap its CO2 emissions uh, by 2030 or earlier, and also to increase the share of non-fossil energy in its total energy mix to 30 percent by 2030. This would require China to add enough non-fossil clean energy to equal that of the entire U.S. electricity system today. Zhang Tao, China is already uh, pretty heavily invested in alternative sources of energy. Uh, I mean, we look at one of the figures, 800 million in 2014 alone, that's 800 million dollars. Where is that money going right now? Uh, I think it, uh, most of the money going to, uh, are going to uh, projects uh, related to renewable energy projects. Um, but uh, I think from our, I don't have the breakdown numbers. Uh, uh, for two, uh, 2014, but I think based on my understanding of the investment uh, distribution, uh, a lot of the money is still, uh, you know, because we work with small, medium-sized enterprises, uh, from our perspective, uh, we, we advocate uh, the policy or, or, or the way of doing things basically by leveraging business solutions to solve China's environmental and social problems. So as far as we can see, I think some of the money have been trickling down to small, medium-sized enterprises, but uh, uh, it's still far from sufficient. Uh, from my perspective, you know, SMEs constitute a big part of the solution to China's environmental problems, uh, but um, SMEs are not necessarily getting the kind of financing they deserve, so to speak, uh, in today's uh, investment uh, climate. What are SMEs? They are small, small medium-sized enterprises. Enter enterprises. So, uh, so um, but, but they are a big part of this. They should be a big part of the solution. Um, if you look at SMEs, they represent probably more than 90 percent of China's job opportunities. They contribute more than 50 percent to China's economy. Uh, so the money shouldn't be just going to like state-owned enterprises or, or right. the big uh, you know, a renewable energy project. This should also be shared uh, by the small, medium-sized enterprises. And is the money going towards research on alternative sources of energy, or is it going into building infrastructure for energy? Uh, I think it should be both. Uh, it is both, and it should be both. Actually, uh, I think uh, the, the China's investment in uh, renewable energy projects, both research and, and real projects, right. uh, is, is, is very big. Uh, it's probably bigger than any other country uh, has invested in uh, renewable energy projects. Uh, uh, so, but, but from our perspective, uh, whether that uh, kind of investment has been, uh, you know, balanced out across the specter mm. uh, is, is a big question. Okay. Wang Tao, you know, just as these Paris talks started, uh, we got a very good reminder of how serious the problem is in China. Beijing issued a red alert, as uh, we've talked about earlier on, that was the first time it's done that. What, are, what is causing these levels of pollution to rise so highly in Beijing? I think, first of all, I would like to point out one of the mistakes that uh, in the, uh, Barbara's response, that China is going to have 20 percent of the energy coming from the non-fossil fuels, not 30 percent. Of course, 30 percent would be better, but I think at the moment, realistically speaking, we are talking about 20 percent in the pledge. As for the uh, smogs, there are various reasons contributing to the heavy uh, pollutions in Beijing for the last two weeks. 
we uh, have all these usual suspects contributing to that, for example, the consumption of coal, the emissions from the vehicles, and also the climate patterns, which result in much less wind for the two weeks, and also a lot of the accumulation of the pollution. But there are also other uh, unexpected factors contributing to that. For example, we heard that there are uh, municipal heating plants in region in the regions nearby Beijing using uncodified coal, so which contributing to much higher level of the sulfur dioxide. And we also heard the heavy lorry, uh, heavy duty lorries transporting the goods inside into Beijing uh, actually fail to meet in the emission treatment device when they come into Beijing and using the diesel that is not high quality. So they are they are reminders to us that the campaign we are facing in terms of the. Uh, air pollution is not a short-term campaign. We cannot solve this issue. This is a long-term battle, and without the enforcement of the regulation and the standards, we may not be able to get very far. We may be able to temporarily control the air pollution through uh, emergency plans like what we have seen in the APEC Blue last, last November and also the military parade this September. But we have to address this from the root, and we have to have a much stronger enforcement and the regulation in order to make sure that we have a sustained approach to address this issue. Right. Barbara, I want you to take a listen to what Hillary Clinton had to say about how China uh, is trying to combat climate change. Hillary Clinton, of course, one of the leading candidates uh, in the presidential election. She was the former Secretary of State here in the United States. Let's take a listen to what she said. I think what the Chinese have done is really smart. Now they've come with, I think, a 900-page report, and they've said, look, we have a lot of work to do because, look, they can't breathe the air. Their water is polluted. Their land is polluted. They have said, okay, we're going to deal with this. But you know what the real trick here is? They're going to be the clean energy superpower of the 21st century. Unless. Unless we get there first. So, Barbara, there you hear it. I mean, we have seen a great deal of cooperation so far between the United States and China on this issue. Uh, but listening to her, does that give you more hope that there will be even greater cooperation between these two countries? You know, the United States and China have developed a partnership on clean energy. They have a uh, eight-person, uh, excuse me, eight climate change working groups to talk about sharing technology um, and sharing policies, experience and enforcement on clean energy technologies, how to monitor, report and verify these technologies. There's a clim clean energy research center that the U.S. and China set up when President Obama first came to China in 2009, under which researchers from both the United States and China are developing new clean energy technologies and working out ways to share the intellectual property. So we think this is a win-win situation for both countries. Um, there are challenges, however, for China in becoming a world energy leader and for the United States in becoming an energy leader in clean energy. And one of the best ways to solve that problem is something that China has announced here uh, as part of the climate negotiations. They are going to launch a national cap and trade program in 2017, which will be the world's largest, three times as large as that in Europe right now. And that will put a price on carbon. And that's so important because it will level the playing field for these clean energy technologies, both existing and new technologies, to break through the marketplace. The other thing China's announced as part of its climate commitments is a power sector reform that is going to prioritize the clean energy, the solar, the wind that it already has built. Even though China now leads the world in installed capacity in both wind and solar, a lot of that uh, wind power, for example, is not making it into the marketplace. And because China's power system still prioritizes coal-fired power generation. So China's in the process of a major power sector reform process. And as part of this, it's going to work very hard to prioritize clean energy and to integrate it better into the air, uh, electricity system. Right. Wang Tao, let's uh, take a look at what uh, one of the Chinese delegates at the Paris talks has been saying, particularly on this issue of carbon trading. Let's watch this first. We are trying to utilize market forces to promote less greenhouse gas emissions, that is, to gradually detach economic growth from CO2 reliance. Carbon trade is a very important method. We want to reduce emissions while not sacrificing economic growth. Plus, we need to bring down costs as well. So what exactly is carbon trading and how does it help China? 
Uh, carbon trading is an economic instrument that uh, will allow people to trade the allowance of the carbon emissions uh, from one to another uh, because this is based on the concept that people will have different business, they are facing different situations, so there will be different costs for them to reduce carbon emission. So in order to have the whole society to reach the lowest or to, uh, to get total cost of reducing carbon emissions, you install this market where people with much lower cost of reducing carbon emissions will be able to sell their surplus of the allowance to those people or industries who are facing much higher cost of reducing the carbon allowance. This is also uh, a very uh, important uh, tool because they set a cap for the whole economy in terms of how much uh, carbon emission is going to be allowed to emit it. Um, so in this case, like for China, we will have to set a target uh, for how much is the total emissions will be allowed for all these industries and regions under the nationalized, uh, under the national level of the carbon emission trading schemes. Of course, they may not include all the industries and uh, emitters, but they will include most of the major ones. And in that way, there will be a cap and there will be a pressure from the top down from the uh, market to tell the, the um, in emitters and polluters how much you have to do and how you be able to reduce the cost of redu uh, in reducing the carbon emissions. And they will actually trading each other with this allowance. And they will also promote the technology improvement and provide economic incentives for them to continue to push for the technology. So this is going to be a quite effective one. But of course, we have also seen this being applied in Europe and also in US, in California, for example, um, sometimes facing difficulties because the allowance or the cap that has been set too high. So right. suddenly when people realize there's no need for them to trade, then the price just collapse. So we have to be very careful when they establish this market in China, but we have learned a lot of lessons and also both US and European has been a lot of country, uh, has been helped China a lot during the whole course. So I'm, I'm quite confident that we're going to learn from their experiences. Right. Barbara, uh, when we look at uh, some of the world's major developing countries, countries like Brazil, South Africa, India, and of course China itself, they have table proposals um, that developed countries, countries like the United States, uh, the countries of Europe, finance the cost of reduced carbon emissions in poorer countries. And we know that six years ago in Copenhagen, Hillary Clinton, in fact, proposed a $100 billion um, in aid per year give, be given to these developing countries. Is that still on the table? Uh, that's still on the table. And just yesterday, Secretary of State John Kerry announced that the United States will double its aid to the world's poorest countries to $800 million to allow them to help them to mitigate the worst impacts and adapt to the impacts of climate change. Um, China has also pledged a fund of 3.1 billion U.S. dollars to help other developing countries adapt to and mitigate climate change. So these funds are going to make a big difference in the, in the ability of the least developed countries, the ones most affected, um, to cope with what's going on. Zhang Tao, there's a Reuters report that poses a very interesting question, and mm -hmm. um, it asks, if China's transition to slower but cleaner growth will, you know, will be sustainable, will it be sustainable? I mean, if growth faults along the way, I mean, will there be a temptation on the part of the uh, government, on the part of Chinese leaders, to go back to, you know, industries that produce a lot of emissions, like steel? Um, well, uh, I think you have to look at China's economy in a holistic way, and also uh, uh, you have to look at China's economic development moving forward. Uh, I think uh, some of the industry sector is definitely becoming antiquated, uh, say, in the next uh, 25, 30 years. Uh, for us, you know, uh, it's, it's important that the Chinese government needs to maintain uh, a certain uh, economic growth rate mm. in order to have uh, stability, so to speak. Right. Uh, but at the same time, you know, environmental problems could cause um, social instability as well. So you have to look at those two factors and, and, and figure out a way to balance them out. Right.